disruptive stupidity. How evolutionary biology explains creativity. Mark Pagel, University of Reading, United Kingdom. I watched the news coverage of the wall coming down on the BBC World Service from my home in Oxford, and I wished I was there. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, I think with the title of my talk like this, I have to begin with an apology, which is to say that I don't think that you are stupid or even collectively stupid. But what I do want to call your attention to is that we rather grandly refer to ourselves as homo sapiens or the wise men. And yet, it turns out that it's, we're not nearly as creative as we'd like to think we are. And I think we all have to admit that we're quite capable of some pretty stupid acts, such as this sort of thing. <laughs> not what we'd think of as a wise thing to do for Homo sapiens, or perhaps this sort of thing. <laughs> and we can even collectively, it turns out, engage in some rather stupid acts, even as a group. Now, these gentlemen in the front of this picture are actually running away from the bull. It was stupid enough to be there in the first place. They're actually running away from the bull. But look at the guy in the orange shirt. He's actually trying to catch the bull. <laughs> okay, but seriously, even in our everyday lives, we are asked to make decisions about things of which we have very little understanding and very little knowledge. For example, we're asked to make decisions about how much to pay into our pension, what mortgage product to buy, what insurance product to buy, what car to buy. And we recognize we have very little understanding of the answers to these things. Similarly, we go through our lives making use of gadgets and things that other people have made. We have no idea where they come from or how they're made or how they work. I even put it to you that no one in this audience would be capable of making something as simple on their own as a pencil. In a famous essay written by Leonard Reed, an economist in 1958, he pointed out that not a single person on the face of this earth knows how to make me. Now this should be salutary. We realize that even to make something as simple as a pencil, you'd have to know how to mine graphite, how to refine it, how to find the wood to put the graphite in, how to ship those products around the world. And so indeed, it turns out that not a single person on Earth probably knows how to make something as simple as a pencil. And I put it to you that there's probably not even 10 people in this audience together who would know how to make something as simple as a pencil. So where is this homo sapiens? Where is this wise man? Where is this creativity and innovation? Because it turns out that if we're honest with ourselves, most of us are just glorified karaoke singers in most aspects of our lives. We go through life using things that other people have made that we don't understand, and we're really just singing their tunes. Well, if it's of any solace to you, it's always been this way. It isn't just you who's stupid. <laughs> This is a hand axe made by an Aboriginal tribe in Western Australia. And I had the great fortune when I was traveling in Australia some years ago to meet an Aboriginal man who had adopted the Christian name Sammy. And he agreed to speak to me through an interpreter. And he showed me how it is that his tribe makes this very hand axe. And while he was showing me how he put the head of the axe onto the handle, I noticed he notched the wood in a certain way for the, handle to, uh, for the head of the axe to fit on. And I thought to myself that I would have notched it differently. It would have made a stronger bond for the head of the axe to fit on. So I said through the interpreter, because I'd been told it was okay to ask questions, I said through my interpreter, ask Sammy why he does it that way rather than this other way. And Sammy just looked at me and answered through the interpreter and said, because we've always done it that way. Now, I don't suggest to you that I had on my own come up with a better way of making this hand axe than his tribe had for perhaps thousands of years. But what I do point out to you is that Sammy didn't know why he made the hand axe that way. He was just another karaoke singer. Okay, well, if this is the state of our innovation and creativity, we want to ask ourselves, 
How is it that we got, as a species, from things like this, to things like this, to things like this, and eventually to the things that we all asked you to turn off a moment ago? How, if we're not very creative and innovative individually, and we are just karaoke singers, how did we arrive at that? Well, the great sort of cultural mythology that we all believe, and I put it to you that every single one of you in this auditorium will believe it when I put it up, but you'll all be wrong, is that we all subscribe to this great thinker view of innovation, that if we just think hard enough about a problem for long enough, there'll be a flash of inspiration and the answer will pop into our minds. But in fact, the truth is much more mundane than that, because when we study the history of the evolution of invention and technology, what we see is that there are virtually no great leaps. Almost all technologies build on previous technologies and ideas and inventions build on the work of others. And what turns out to be the case is that evolution, rather than making us good at invention and creativity, has made us good at copying others. And this has meant that our species was able to use whole groups of individuals as collective minds in a collective inventive exercise. And that's where our objects come from. Because what it means is that if a good idea pops up over here and another good idea pops up over here, even if by chance, because we can copy those ideas, they can sweep through our societies and one idea can build upon the other, can build upon the other. So we, we ridicule, even scorn, the power of copying, but in fact, if we were to write down a very simple sort of pictorial algorithm for how our species has attained the technological complexity that's all around us in this building at the moment, it would be something like the following. That individuals copy what each other makes, we're tinkerers then, we modify things, we play with things, and so sometimes we change the form of objects, and then the real innovation happens when somebody just almost by chance has the idea of putting two things together to make a brand new object, and sometimes that object even can have functions that we hadn't considered when we built the thing at first. And so early in our evolutionary history, we know that we made hand axes. These are things that we've been making for 40, 50, 60, even more tens of thousands of years than that. And we made clubs. And people modified those hand axes, made a variety of shapes and so on of those hand axes, and a variety of different kinds of clubs and sticks were made. And then somebody had the idea to put those two together, and the first hafted axe was created. Inventions build upon inventions. They form the sort of groundwork for an accelerating pace of change as ideas are copied, modified, tinkered with, and combined to produce new objects. And we shouldn't feel like this is a description that only applies to us because it's the same recipe that evolution by natural selection has used for billions of years to create the marvelous diversity of all living forms on this planet. Exactly the same algorithm of copying, modifying, and combining goes into the way we got from simple organisms like these little single-celled yeast to complex organisms like ourselves. Natural selection copies genes when it reproduces organisms. Sometimes it modifies those genes when mutations creep in, and those mutations aren't very intelligent. They're random. Genes simply acquire errors. Some of those errors turn out to be good ones. Some of them, most of them are bad ones. Every now and then, evolution puts combinations of these new genes together to create a new species. A completely blind process that has led to organisms and, and organs and traits that are more complex than anything our best engineers have ever designed. Even something as simple as my kidney is far more complicated than a space shuttle. And yet it's this same algorithm of copying, modifying, and then combining that has led to our great um, um, march towards technological complexity. Well, you might not believe what I'm telling you, but when we go to the great inventors in our history, we see that they're actually following this same rule. We often credit Thomas Edison with creating the light bulb. Well, he didn't create the light bulb. In fact, what Thomas Edison did was modify a number of previous light bulbs. And the way he modified that light bulb was to make a better filament so that that filament didn't burn out. And if you look at his records, 
He tried thousands of different materials for that filament. He didn't just think hard about how to make a better light bulb. He tried thousands of different materials and eventually came up with one that just happens to work. He tinkered, he modified, and then he combined, and poof, then the light bulb went on. Henry Ford didn't invent the assembly line. He didn't invent component parts. He didn't invent specialization. All of those things were already present in the 19th century, what Henry Ford did was he put them together in a way that was better than anybody had before him. Incremental steps building on the ideas of others, not great leaps of imagination and insight. James Watt didn't invent the steam engine. He was actually asked to improve upon a design by Newcomb. And in, in working with Newcomb's steam engine, James Watt came up with a better one. And now in the lower corner there, Steve Jobs. We often credit him with the genius of the point and click operating system for the Macintosh. But if you're the Xerox Corporation, you'd say that he stole it from them. And they've taken him to court over that. That Stephen Jobs actually stole from Xerox the idea for the point and click operating system. And this points out yet another feebleness in our ability to be creative and imaginative and so on. And that is that the Xerox Corporation didn't even realize what a gold mine they were sitting on. Jobs did. That was his invention and insight. Okay, well, if there, if there is a feebleness to our creativity and invention, and if it really is the collective mind that is responsible for our great technological march, how does that stand us for the coming challenges of the next century? You know, we live in a time when technological change is extraordinary social and political change, but really more importantly are the sort of grand challenges that are facing the earth, things we've heard about you know, like human rights violations, poverty, climate change, resource scarcity, how are we going to solve those problems if we are so feeble as inventors and technologists and so on? Well, it turns out that there is reason to be both hopeful and reason to be worried. This remarkable image is not a map of the world. This is a map of Facebook friendship links that when you plot them by their latitude and longitude of the person sitting at their computer literally draws a map of the world. And this tells us that the world is connected in a way that it's never been connected before and so the collective mind is in some sense primed in a way that it's never been primed before. If someone has an idea on one far corner of the earth that idea can spread to the other corner of the earth at nearly the speed of light. And so we live at a time when this, this ability to copy, tinker, modify, and then combine is greater than ever before. But we also run the risk, living in this modern society, of becoming compliant and docile in our thinking, almost bovine or cow-like in our thinking, when we literally let a world in which Google might do our thinking for us. And so we have to worry that we might be running the risk that the internet is actually making us even more stupid than we were as we sit back and let others do our thinking for us. So when we live in a world of tweets and retweets and Facebook likes and so on, maybe that lulls us into a sort of docility and compliant mode that we should be worried about. And so really the, 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 the answer to my story or the answer to creativity is to say, well, how is it that we avoid staying on one side of this wall and that's that more than ever before in the world, we need to learn, as this Chinese man is doing, who's copying English expressions down and translating them into Chinese and vice versa, that if we're going to break down barriers, we need to learn more than ever before to cooperate and collaborate <coughs> across traditional boundaries. Thank you very much.